Hi everyone. Welcome to another episode of Das Criminal Podcast. I'm Erin. And it's Amr, and I certainly hope you're not listening to this while you're having a nice meal at your local fast food joint. Yeah, I've wanted to do this case for a while. It was really challenging to find information because most of the sources are Chinese and I do not understand Chinese. So I did my best to research in English and use online translators when necessary. But I had to look up some pronunciation since I don't know how to read Chinese, so sometimes I'm transliterating. We always do our best to find correct pronunciations because honestly, it can be a little bit disrespectful to talk about sensitive topics and like not even bother to look up the proper pronunciations. But we do apologize for any mistakes we might make. Also, Chinese media typically refers to people by their family name and then their given name as that's how people use someone's full name in China. So we're going to refer to the victim as Wu Xiuyan, her full name, or Xiuyan, her given name, as we typically use the victim's given names. It's just more humanizing that way. So when we talk about people, the second name that you hear is their given name. Also, a content warning for this one, there is violence against people and animals. So if you're really sensitive to that, not the best episode for you. Yeah. We have all been in public at one time or another when some ultra-religious crank gets up on their soapbox and starts preaching. In pretty much every major city I've ever lived, except in the Middle East, where that sort of behavior historically gets you crucified, I've encountered these clowns outside subway stops and on street corners. If you ever come to Toronto, pro tip, avoid Dundas Square. Though if you want, you can go there because that's the perfect example of religious coexistence. When you see Muslims peddling Qurans next to a guy talking about like the Bible being the sort of source of like a warning to modern day sinners, it's quite amusing. If you're like me, you try your best to avoid eye contact and go on with your day. Most of us don't want to be bothered by the gospel while leaving work or running errands. This is how Wu Shouyan felt when a group of people claiming to be missionaries started proselytizing in a McDonald's in Zhao Yuan, Shengdong, China. In May of 2014, Wu Shouyan worked as a salesperson in a clothing store. On the evening of May 28th, a Wednesday, Shouyan went to the local McDonald's after her shift to wait for her husband and son. Now, most sources I found report Shouyan as 37 years old and her son as 7 years old, but articles in the South China Morning Post and the BBC cite Shouyan as 35 and her son as 5. Despite these discrepancies, we can definitely say that Shouyan was in her mid-30s and married with a young son. Another article in The Guardian says that her 7-year-old son was with her, but based on all the articles I've read, I think it's more likely that Wu Shouyan was by herself at the McDonald's. As Wu Shouyan minded her own business, this group of missionaries, 5 adults and one 12-year-old, entered the McDonald's, and began sermonizing. They were allegedly members of a small quasi-Christian religious sect called the Church of Almighty God, and they wanted people to join them. Okay, it's so hilarious to me that these people thought they'd find, like, disciples at a McDonald's. Because, I don't know about you, but if I'm starting a cult, I wouldn't exactly go recruiting at the local fast food joint and try to aim for something more amenable to my message. Once in a while, someone posts a TikTok or something where another person comes up to them, usually in a restaurant or some kind of public space, and says something like, God told me to talk to you. Well, did he? He told you to talk to me. I feel like if God is talking to you and telling you to socialize, that's a bit too on the nose for my liking. I suppose if you are religious, then any sort of inclination you might get, any sort of pull, you would believe is God telling you to do something rather than just a spontaneous idea you had. Yeah, the same thing as people seeing Jesus on their toast instead of like a weirdly shaped burn pattern. Right, right. So the group demanded that customers provide their cell phone number so they could be contacted about future religious events, 
saving them in their contacts list as Little Sheep 1, Little Sheep 2, and so on. Wu Shuoyan refused to give her number. If I had to guess, and this is a guess on my part, but a reasonable one, I think, Shuoyan said something along the lines of, no thanks, but the preachers kept pushing. As the religious group became more enraged with Wu Shuoyan's refusal to give out her phone number, things took a dark turn. One of the sect members later testified that she, quote, saw an unusual airflow, end quote, around Wu Shuoyan's clothing, as if they were moving even though there was no wind inside the McDonald's. This, according to the woman, is how she knew that Wu Shuoyan was a devil with supernatural powers. According to this testimony, the religious group called Wu Shuoyan a devil, and then some sort of argument ensued. I'm inclined to believe that this wasn't so much a two-sided altercation as it was these religious zealots screeching at Wu Shuoyan, first because there are five of them, six if you include the 12-year-old and one of her, and second because, as we're about to see, they seem prone to extreme overreactions. Yeah, I mean, even if she responded, I don't know if saying, I'm not a devil, fuck off, is equivalent to being yelled at by six psychotic freaks. Right. The woman testified that Wu Shuoyan, quote, phoned someone and called us freaks, end quote. Again, I'm assuming here, but I'd bet that Shuoyan called her husband and said something like, hey, can you hurry up? These Jesus freaks are here calling me a devil. Or she called someone else she knew and told them some freaks were harassing her at McDonald's. Now, I can only speak for myself, but in the past, if someone in public has pestered me or made me uncomfortable, I've texted other people and been like, OMG, this weirdo at the grocery store just told me I have nice feet. Like, what the fuck? Like, don't engage in cringe behavior in public if you don't want other people commenting on it. Just my two cents. Okay, I do have to admit that we're about, like, I don't know, how many episodes are we in? And this is the first time in our true crime podcast that someone had tried to use the they called me a freak defense in their testimony because, you know, let's see how that plays out. Could be good. They are freaks, though. Like, they are. Oh, they absolutely are. Don't get me wrong. Like, you know, if someone did that to me, I'd basically be calling my friends being like they're, they're trying to sell me Bibles or whatever. At this point, the missionaries lost it. They beat Wu Shuyan with metal mops that they'd apparently brought with them to the McDonald's, which in my mind speaks to premeditation, but we'll get to that later. Someone threw a chair at Shuyan, and her attackers stomped on her head and face. Okay, this raises far more questions than it answers, because if these people brought metal mops to McDonald's with them, do they carry these mops everywhere they go? And is there some sort of hierarchy within the cult where you sort of like, kind of like a video game, as you advance up the ranks, your weapons get upgraded? So like, you know, the cult's common disciples carry mops, the leaders get baseball bats, whereas like the supreme leader gets like a crowbar or like a gun or something. Yeah, it's bizarre behavior. All the while, the six people beating Wu Shuoyan screamed at her. One of the assailants yelled, Go die, evil spirit. And another yelled, Kill her, beat her to death. Someone also warned bystanders who might try to help Wu Shuoyan, quote, will kill anyone who gets involved, end quote. The 12-year-old kicked Shuoyan in the head saying, Evil goes to hell. The entire incident was captured on CCTV and filmed on someone's cell phone. Now, I watched the cell phone footage, and I wouldn't say it's necessarily graphic because you can't really see what's going on, but you can hear people shouting, and the situation clearly becomes more chaotic. But since I don't understand Chinese, I couldn't really make out what was happening. But be warned that if you search for information about this case, there is disturbing video footage linked to the event. The attackers beat Wu Shuoyan so brutally that she died from her injuries. Police arrived at the scene quickly, as other customers and staff at the McDonald's had called them for help, but it was too late to save Shuoyan. The attackers didn't try to flee. Eerily, when the police arrived, the 12-year-old was still kicking Wu Shuoyan in the head, as though he didn't understand that what he was doing was wrong and criminal. This isn't a whodunit case, as police took the perpetrators into custody at the scene. The CCTV and cell phone footage, plenty of eyewitnesses, and confessions by the assailants make the murder of Wu Shuoyan in terms of who attacked her an open and shut case. The question is why a group of six people beat a stranger to death in the middle of McDonald's. 
So join us as we do a deep dive into religious cults in China and how an entire family became dangerously radicalized. Let's first take a look at the perpetrators of this horrific crime. Zhang Li Dong, born in 1959, was 55 years old at the time of the attack. He was accompanied by his lover, Zheng Qiu Lin, born in 1990, and three of his children from a previous marriage, Zheng Fan, born 1984, Zheng Hang, born 1996, and I believe the 12-year-old, who I'm not going to name because they are a minor. I just want to point out that if these dates are correct, that means Zhang Li Dan was dating a 24-year-old who was not only less than half his age, but also six years younger than his own daughter. Go ahead and call me a sex-negative Puritan, but that is weird. I am 25, and the thought of dating someone old enough to be my parent with a 30-year-old daughter of their own is unfathomable. Every family has their weird shit, but that is pretty high on my creepy behavior list. Right, you know, just a wholesome family night out with your large adult daughters, your lover who's younger than your daughter, and your minor kid who's enjoying a nice evening in town. We're going to go into more detail about this family later, but everything is weird. I mean, obviously, like... Oh, yeah. This is actually a bunch of freaks. There is a big red flag over why he's with his lover and not, you know, the wife and mother of the children. So the Zhang family was joined by a friend and fellow sect member named Liu Yingchun, born in 1975, who turns out to be pretty crucial to this story. According to the information I was able to find, the Zhang family, the attackers, were from Wuji County in Hebei province. It's a pretty small county. In 2003, it had just under 500,000 people, which isn't very many considering that even back then, China's population was almost 1.3 billion people. Other than that, I can't find much specific information about these people in English, so I'm using online translators to read articles from the Beijing News. This case was pretty infamous in China and heavily covered by the media there, so it's not as though there's no information out there, but it's different from well-known American or British cases where you've got hundreds of tabloid articles, a Netflix docuseries, and dozens of podcasts talking about everything from the killer's sexual histories to their favorite serial. As far as I can tell, victims' protection laws in the People's Republic of China are pretty firm, and Wu Xiaoyan is rather exceptional in that her name was released to the media. Apparently, her family had to ask the government to find a new school for her son because the press revealed details about the murder. Now, before people start talking about Chinese censorship, it's pretty common for courts around the world to withhold the names of victims or perpetrators when publishing them would threaten a fair trial or the privacy of people's families. Ireland has made it illegal to publish the names of Anna Kriegel's killers since they were both minors, so the media calls them Boy A and Boy B. New Zealand also suppressed the name of Grace Mullane's murderer until about six months ago. Now, we don't consider either of these governments restrictive of the press or free speech. And I actually agree that withholding the name of someone accused of a crime can be crucial to a fair trial. And I empathize with victims' families who don't want information about their loved ones splashed all over newspapers and tabloids. Yeah, on that note, there has actually been a recent controversy here in Canada over a decision to fine a victim of sexual assault $2,600 for breaking a publication ban and revealing her name and identity to the press. Canadian law generally dictates that the victim of sexual assault must remain anonymous, but this woman sent a transcript of the court proceedings to her family and friends, and the transcripts of course identified her and her ex-husband, who was the perpetrator, by name, and so because she revealed that she was fined $2,600, and on a similar note, Morel Andrews was sexually assaulted by her driving instructor, and she successfully appealed to the court to lift the publication ban on her identity so that she could share her victim impact statement publicly. And I personally, I'm a big supporter of maintaining the privacy of both victims and protecting the rights of defendant to a fair trial. But I do think these kinds of laws are kind of absurd when they sort of anonymize you without your own awareness, if that makes sense. Yeah, I do think it's a complicated discussion, but I don't think China is in any way exceptional in that discussion. Oh, yeah, no, no, not at all. So we can't tell you much about Wu Shoyan, but we do know that her family deeply loved her. Shoyan's husband, Jin Zhongqing, and her mother-in-law were absolutely distraught by the murder. Jin wrote on social media, and this is so heartbreaking, quote, 
I didn't want to tell my son what happened, but he seemed to understand and kept comforting me, telling me not to cry or be sad and that mom was watching us from above. My heart has been ripped to pieces. My wife, have you heard our son's words? We miss you so much. End quote. I can't even imagine how they must have felt. Wu Shoyan was almost attacked at random and it was so, so brutal. I'm not sure how her family could ever recover from that grief. We know a good deal more about the people who took Wu Shoyan away from her loving family thanks to a detailed article published in the Beijing News. When you Google information about this case, Zhang Lidong's picture typically pops up first, a bald guy with a bright orange prisoner vest. And it's the only still image on the Wikipedia article about the event. This, and perhaps a bit of sexism when it comes to cult leadership, might lead us to believe that Zhang Lidong led his family down the path of the Almighty God. But Zhang Lidong wasn't actually the leader or the most fervent of the group. His daughter, Zhang Fan, and her friend, Lu Yingshan, were the driving forces behind this small cult. Born in 1975, Lu Yingshan was a worker in a shopping mall in Longku, Yantai, but was laid off from or quit her job. Lu Yingchun found herself drawn to the Church of Almighty God, otherwise known as Eastern Lightning, in 1998, when she was around 23 years old. Falling deeper into the sex teachings, she divorced her husband and left her daughter to pursue a more spiritual life. Red flag number one. If a religious community compels you, whether explicitly or otherwise, to leave a partner or family, they're not normal. This is a cult and they're trying to isolate you for easier manipulation. Get out when you can. Yeah, I agree. Huge, huge red flag there. Meanwhile, Zhang Fan was going through troubles of her own. Born in Wuji in 1984, she was a polite child and an excellent student. Much to her family's pride, she earned admittance into the Beijing Broadcasting Institute, now called the Communication University of China, in 2002, graduating from junior college in 2004. But despite her academic success, Fan struggled emotionally. She felt as though she had lost her purpose in life. She later told police that at this point, she was depressed and thinking about suicide. In autumn of 2005, Zheng Fan quit her job in Beijing. Around this time, Fan went to visit her aunt in Tongling, Anhui. There, she found a copy of the Bible, and the passages spoke to her. Zheng Fan decided that she would dedicate her life to working for Jesus. She re-enrolled at her alma mater, Communication University of China, in the hopes that expanding her education in broadcasting would help her reach more people with the Lord's Word. During her winter vacation in 2007, Zhang Fan picked up a book by or about the Church of Almighty God, called The Secret Work of God. Again, the text resonated with Fan. She felt as though her life had new purpose and meaning, and the suicidal thoughts went away. Zhang Fan knew that she had to become involved somehow with Eastern Lightning. But Zhang Fan wasn't able to find any Almighty God believers in or around Beijing. I've been there before. Sometimes in big cities, despite their dense populations, it's the most challenging place to connect with people. Yeah, I mean, I find that big cities are counterintuitively designed to almost atomize and isolate people much more so than smaller towns. And cities are extremely alienating by design. Though in this case, I'm not sure if letting religious freaks and fanatics build a community is a good thing. So, Fawn did what lots of us would do. She searched for like-minded people on the internet. In October of 2008, Fawn came across what she considered a remarkable speech in an online forum. She contacted its author, Lu Yingshan, and they began chatting about their mutual interest in Eastern Lightning. So you're probably wondering, what the hell is Eastern Lightning? Buckle up and get ready to swallow a whole lot of buffoonery. Established in China in 1991, the Church of Almighty God, sometimes called Eastern Lightning or Quanning Shen, is a monotheistic new religious movement that believes Jesus Christ has returned to earth in the form of a Chinese woman. We touched on new religious movements in our episode on Shincheonji in Korea, but basically, they are religious or spiritual groups that have bases in pre existing denominations, but then add on to these. If we want to get technical, lots of religions that we now consider mainstream started as new religious movements in the sense that someone started with common spiritual practice and began preaching something new or different on top of that. Jesus himself was a Jew from Nazareth with a small but loyal cult of followers, 
which eventually mushroomed into a distinct major religion. Yeah, on that note, Muhammad himself was, he wasn't a Jew per se, he was a Hanif, just to say a monotheist that wasn't Christian or Jewish. But he did adopt many of the defining features of Islam from Jewish tribes in the region, not in a small part due to a deliberate attempt to recruit them into his nascent movement. And only when they explicitly rejected him did the Muslim community sort of veer away from Jewish behavior, for example, moving the Qibla from the Qibla being the direction in which Muslims pray, from Jerusalem to Mecca, for example, and sort of chart its course as an independent polity. I'd say that generally speaking, new religious movements are not accepted as legitimate by the mainstream religions whose texts and teachings they use. In a way, we could argue that new religious movements often appropriate aspects of other religions for their own use. I don't necessarily mean this in a negative or accusatory sense. It's just worth noting that they typically borrow from mainstream religions, but then add on their own prophets and doctrines. New religious movements are not synonymous with cults, though there is a lot of overlap, as we will discuss. It's actually fascinating how many new religious movements sprout in post-colonial countries, because it almost feels like colonialism would lead to a rupture in people's identities and communities, and the sort of imports of Christianity by missionaries would lead to a fertile ground for new religious movements to sort of build on an existing Christian myth- mythology in an attempt to rebuild a communal identity and articulate a sense of purpose. Contrary to what some media might have you believe, organized religion is not illegal in the People's Republic of China, and upwards of 2.5% of the population self-identifies as Christian. Christianity has been an influential force in China. British colonialism brought with it religious advocates and missionaries who sought to proselytize in the region. The 1850-1864 Taiping Rebellion against China's Qing dynasty had a Christian religious slant, as the uprising's commander, Hong Shiquan, claimed to be the brother of Jesus Christ. The unrecognized oppositional state even called itself the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom. At its peak, the kingdom had about 30 million people under Hong's totalitarian, theocratic, and highly militarized rule. From 1899 to 1901, members of the Boxer Rebellion fought back against Christian missionaries as tools of imperialism in China. The Boxers killed thousands of Chinese Christians and 200 to 250 foreign nationals, most of whom were Christian missionaries and their families. Before researching for this episode, I'm pretty embarrassed to say that I wasn't aware of the extent to which Christianity, both in the form of foreign missionaries and Chinese Christian-based new religious movements, has influenced politics in China. I feel like I should have known this, but somehow I'm uncovering a lot of information that I've never heard before. Another piece of world history lost in the American education system. Now, Karl Marx was quite critical of religion, dubbing it the opium of the masses. He believed that as people found more purpose in their daily lives through more equitable and community-based living, they would move away from organized religion. Looking at China specifically, we have to recognize that for millennia of emperor's rule in China, leaders claimed a mandate of heaven. That is, they were spiritually entitled to those positions. Even the Taiping Rebellion, though it weakened the Qing dynasty, wasn't anti-theocratic or pro-worker in nature. So when the workers took control of the government, hostility toward religion and other superstitions that enabled the old regime actually makes sense from a political perspective. You might not like it, but letting go of certain traditions was instrumental to China's cultural revolution. Now, I'm not a religious scholar and probably not a good person to ask about the relationship between religion and communism, but I have some very good friends who are communists and also devout in their faith. Personally, though, I'm an atheist and I don't find spirituality liberating, nor do I want it to be part of my government. I also think attempts by some well-meaning people to describe Jesus or Muhammad as socialist or or proto-socialist are wide off the mark because A, Socialism, by definition, requires a certain level of development in a means of production that didn't exist in Jesus or Muhammad's time. And B, socialism sees material conditions as a driving force behind history, something that directly contravenes the fundamental concepts of, you know, prophethood, whether it's Muhammad or Jesus, who preached, you know, of a divine being, a divine entity being in control, and eschewed materialism for a sort of idealistic moralism in which behavior is motivated by sort of spiritual morality and a promise of the afterlife instead of by material conditions or class interest. In his report on an investigation of the peasant movement in Hunan published in 1927, 
Chairman Mao writes of an interaction with some peasants discussing religion, quote, The gods? Worship them by all means. But if you had only Lord Guan and the goddess of mercy, and no peasant association, could you have overthrown the local tyrants and evil gentry? The gods and goddesses are indeed miserable objects. You have worshipped them for centuries, and they have not overthrown a single one of the local tyrants or evil gentry for you. Now you want to have your rent reduced. Let me ask, how will you go about it? Will you believe in the gods or in the peasant association? End quote. He then describes the town people's reaction. Quote, My words made the peasants roar with laughter. End quote. Mao is such an alpha. <laughs> such a king. Such a fucking king. Yeah, I think Mao makes a really excellent point here. Change doesn't spawn from prayer or worship. It generates from action. Our material conditions are much more consequential to our lives than our belief systems or lack thereof. And as a cancer survivor, Amr, I'm sure you're better able to speak on this than me. If I'm sick, I don't want thoughts and prayers. I want the best medical care available. I want doctors and nurses at the top of their field, and I want well-funded research into treatments for my condition. On the one hand, I understand, you know, work colleagues or friends or even family reaching out with the usual thoughts and prayers rhetoric as a means to express some sort of sympathy and support. But on the other hand, I also deeply appreciated friends, my friends' material support. Like I had various friends who dropped off care packages, food, cards for Uber Eats or skip the dishes. I had a nurse, a nurse friend come up and medic, like, you know, medically check in on me and administer my medication. And, you know, I had people come in and cook for me and so on. And I think that was a lot more helpful, obviously, in the material sense. And I also think that my situation was a lot easier because of the combination of single payer healthcare here in Toronto, which removes all my worries about cost. I just had to go to the hospital and show them my health card, and that was that. And my unionized job offering paid medical leave for a prolonged period of time to recover without risk of retribution. So when someone says thoughts and prayers, I get it. But it's also an easy way to deflect from, you know, materially helping someone. Right. And I think that if you are religious and you genuinely believe that prayer has an effect, you should be praying for, you know, your courage in standing up for the oppressed. Not that God is going to intervene and do it for you. I think that's what Marx means when he says religion is the opiate to the masses. I think fundamentally, it redirects the sort of rage, the sort of justified rage of, of the working class. If you're being exploited and you know who the exploiter is, it's easy to be docile when your religion teaches you that the person who's exploiting you will be punished in the afterlife. So you could just sort of accept things um, with the idea that you're going to be promised the earth or heaven or whatever. Or inherit the meek inherit the earth, you know. Whereas if you really believed in helping the poor and helping the, the dispossessed and the oppressed, then you shouldn't wait for an afterlife. You should do that in the current life, which you know is antithetical to the religion being a sort of immobilizing force. Right. And this is kind of a hot take. I might erase this later. But if you honestly believe that God is very much controlling the earth as it is. That's sort of a conservative or even reactionary belief because it means you think we're not supposed to change what God has done. We're not supposed to believe that this is unfair and that we as human beings should do something about it. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, of, of course, I completely agree. And, you know, if you want to remove this, you can go ahead. But I fully stand by this. Honestly, I think you should keep it. I think you can't have your cake and eat it too, right? If you have, you know, dispossession and exploitation and oppression on Earth and God exists, then either God wants this to happen, in which case fighting against it is wrong against religion, or God doesn't care, which is apathy, which it's not great either ways. You know, I don't think you can reconcile belief in a divine entity that is omnipotent and omnipresent. And I know this is a very much like an r slash atheism hot take, but you can't reconcile omnipresence and omnipotency with the material conditions on Earth. Getting back to Mao. In his more famous 1957 essay, On the Correct Handling of Contradictions Among the People, he writes of the party's stance on religion, quote, All attempts to use administrative orders or coercive measures to settle ideological questions or questions of right and wrong are not only ineffective, but harmful. We cannot abolish religion by administrative order or force people not to believe in it. We cannot compel people to give up idealism any more than we can force them to embrace Marxism, end quote. If we take Mao at his word here, he's an atheist who considers religion ineffective idealism. 
He supports China as a non-religious state with religious freedoms. We can see this reflected to some degree in China's policy of state atheism, which maintains the state and party should be non-religious, but allows limited religious freedom. But Mao also notes that some religious groups and tendencies can be reactionary. So the question becomes, how should the state address these groups? With this type of question, we can find ourselves in a sort of postmodern ideological bind. A progressive state can't have total religious freedom in the sense of allowing people to abuse others in the name of religion. Are Iraq and Syria oppressing ISIS by not allowing them to form a fundamentalist caliphate? I certainly think not. Just as I think the tolerant left is an asinine thing to say because the left is openly hostile toward oppression and exploitation, as we should be, I don't think we should accept religion-based harm just because the perpetrators have some spiritual justification. Just because something is your sincerely held belief doesn't make it moral, harmless, or worthy of respect from other people. You can't kill people or colonize their land or deny them rights or force them into conversion therapy because your God says so. On that note, I find that leftists are a lot more hesitant to point that out with regards to Islam and contrast to, you know, criticism of Christianity, which is warranted, no doubt. But Christianity is seen as both a colonizer religion and a white religion, so it's fine to attack it vociferously. Whereas Islam, I feel like a lot of leftists tend to tiptoe around it, even though it warrants similar criticism. But I don't think a socialist society should tolerate Islamic political parties or associations in any way. Well, since we have established that society can, in fact, place limits on religion, we now have to decide what those limits should be, especially with regard to fanatical religious groups and cults. Who decides which religions are mainstream and which are not? What distinguishes a cult from a devout but benign religious group? Should cults be banned even if they aren't otherwise breaking the law? Where do we draw these lines? Now, I'm not sure about my answers to some of these questions, but one phenomenon I think we need to tackle is child sexual abuse within religious groups. We talked about this more in our episode on Josh Duggar, and I don't want to draw that entire discussion back into this episode because it's really sensitive, but I think we can all agree that child sexual abuse is never acceptable. If you think anything else, turn off this podcast and go get yourself some help. Like, what are you doing here? I think there's a distinction between eschewing religious extremism and an entire religious group both personally and politically. I would be friends with someone of any religious background because I would never discriminate against that sort of thing. But I don't want to be friends with ultra-religious people of any faith because we have a significant value clash. And I don't want my friends preaching to me just like I don't preach to them. But I'm just a person, not a state. I think it's more dangerous when the state decides which groups are permitted and which are forbidden because the state has the power to criminalize, incarcerate, and inflict violence with impunity. Yeah, but to be fair, there's a big difference between inflicting violence on religious people as individuals and, for example, blanket banning political parties that are religious and slash or enshrining secularism as a sort of non-negotiable part of a country's law, like, for example, in France. Yeah, Radio Warner has done some stellar episodes on surveillance and repression in China with guests like Carl Zha and Vadim Mikhailov. Due to the CCP's restrictions, many religious groups found and practiced their sex in unofficial house churches, which are essentially just that, churches held in people's homes or other nondescript buildings instead of chapels. Eastern Lightning, or as it calls itself, the Church of Almighty God, is one such group. Rising out of an amorphous congregation labeled the Shouters, Eastern Lightning began spreading in 1991. Perhaps due to the sex secretive tendencies, information is difficult to confirm. Allegedly, the organization's two central figures are a man named Zhao Weishan, born in 1951, and a woman named Yang Xingbin, born in 1973. Some sources I found cite Zhao and Yang as a couple. Since September of 2000, they have lived in the United States after being granted political asylum. They are suspected of living somewhere in the New York metropolitan area, though according to an Eastern Lightning representative based in Taiwan, members are forbidden from knowing their exact location. According to Eastern Lightning's doctrines, Jesus Christ has reappeared on Earth in the form of Yang Xingbin. Thus, she is known as the Almighty God and often referred to as He rather than She. Somewhere in the world, I swear to God, a women's and gender studies graduate student's ears just perked up as they have uncovered the topic for their upcoming thesis, The Female Christ, Queering Cults in China. 
kill me. Just shoot me right now, for the love <laughs> of God. Please just end me. So according to scholar Emily Dunn, Zhao Weishan, a former physics teacher, claimed membership in various Christian new religious movements in China before linking up with Yang Shengbin. In 1991, it was actually Zhao leading a small but growing religious organization. Soon after, Zhao claimed that Yang was the second coming of Jesus Christ. We see this in nearly every cult episode we cover on the podcast. The leader starts off as a member in other fringe religious groups before realizing, hey, I could just start my own cult. This was the case of Lee Man Hee of South Korea's Shincheonji sect. Yeah, I mean, if you want something done right, you got to do it yourself. And also, franchising opportunities are never as good as spinoffs. I do find it interesting that Jiang didn't claim he himself was Jesus reborn. Rather, this woman follower was. I mean, I guess I, he realized it would be much easier to have a pliable follower act as a front woman, where he sort of stays in the background insofar as it offers him a lot more leeway, I guess, to do what he wants. I actually think this sort of spinoff, as you said, happens all the time. A follower in a cult realizes he or she would rather be a leader, but there's no room for another leader within the cult. So that person branches off and starts their own sect, borrowing ideas from their former cult and inventing some of their own. In my reading of the case, this is precisely what happened with Eastern Lightning and the people who eventually murdered Wu Shoyan. Eastern Lightning itself was founded from a splinter group of the Shouters, and some of its members decided they too could start their own religious sects and have more power than they would in the Eastern Lightning organization, and so on and so forth. So we're talking about a branch of a branch of a branch of a branch that's really not connected to the original cult. Now I'm going to make an assumption here, and while I haven't seen this verified in any source, I'm pretty confident in my theory. And please hold on to this nugget because it will come back in our discussion later. If it's correct that Zhao met Yang Xinbin in 1991, and the reported birth years are accurate, then Zhao would have been about 40 years old and Yang would have been only 18. Yikes. According to the Chinese authorities, Yang had a history of mental health problems. If this is true, she would have been even more vulnerable. I think Zhao Weishan is the real leader of the Church of Almighty God, and Yang Shengbin, his lover, is a proxy through whom he preaches, as though giving himself one degree of separation from the reincarnation of Jesus Christ somehow makes it more believable. I'm going to say it. I think this term is sometimes misapplied, but I think we have a genuine case of grooming here. I think it's definitely grooming in that sense, but I also think it's accurate insofar as I guess it was a correct calculation that it's a lot more believable when someone else claims someone else is a reincarnation of Jesus and not yourself. Mm -hmm. Eastern Lightning is vehemently anti-communist, referring to the CCP as the Great Red Dragon. A former member speaking to Brendan Hong for the Daily Beast said that Eastern Lightning's, quote, ultimate goal is to defeat the Red Dragon, end quote, though Hong couldn't reach the leaders of Eastern Lightning for comment. Current and former Eastern Lightning members have alleged abuse up to and including imprisonment, torture, and murder at the hands of the Chinese government due to their unorthodox faith. In turn, the Chinese government accuses Eastern Lightning of using violent recruiting methods and harming its followers. Now, the CCP doesn't try to hide the fact that it wants to keep religious extremism, including cults, out of China. And Eastern Lightning is a banned group. Promoting it in China could get someone arrested. But I'm skeptical of the reports of torture, most of which come from the U.S. State Department and ultimately trace back to accusations from Eastern Lightning members themselves. Now, let me be clear. I don't think people should ever be tortured for their religious beliefs, especially if those people might have fallen victim to a predatory cult. People in sects that preach violence or bigotry need to be de-radicalized, certainly, but never tortured. And there's a distinction between the leaders of these sects who use their positions to exploit people and the followers who they exploit. Regarding the Chinese government's indictments of Eastern Lightning, we'll get to these in more detail later, but it's worth noting that the authorities have accused Eastern Lightning of some pretty shocking recruitment tactics, including kidnapping, drugging, and beating people. I also understand the Chinese government's wariness of religious extremist groups as possible tools for foreign intervention and imperialism. I mean, after all, the Falun Gong, which is another religious organization that originated in China, is pretty close to the U.S. State Department and intelligence agencies. Keeping that in mind with the U.S.'s long history of arming and funding Islamic jihadi groups like the Mujahideen in Afghanistan. 
Among the Western allies of Eastern Lightning are groups like Cessner, which Professor Stephen A. Kent has described as the, quote, highest profile lobbying and information group for controversial religions, end quote. Cessner's scholars have advocated for groups like Eastern Lightning, the Church of Scientology, Order of the Solar Temple, Unification Church in Shincheonji in Korea, and Om Shinrikyo. Cessner met severe criticism after one of its board members, J. Gordon Melton, flew to Japan at the expense of Om Shinrikyo to conduct an independent investigation after the Tokyo subway attack in 1995. They said the report proved that the cult couldn't have produced the sarin gas that killed 14 people and that Om Shinrikyo was being scapegoated. Surprise, Om Shinrikyo was responsible and lots of other scholars called out Melton for being a hack. Journalist David Kirk also interviews Melton for an article on Eastern Lightning for the Daily Beast, and Melton tells him that the CCP persecutes these innocent people. But like, what kind of source is he? It's like asking for Dick Cheney's analysis of the DPRK's nuclear program. If there's anyone who has lied about that sort of thing before, it's him! If we dig into our sources on this case, which we at Das Kriminal always try to do, we're just met with layers and layers of what appears to be biased reporting. Like, how could I ever take this melting guy seriously after he said Om Shinrikyo didn't do it, after being flown to Japan on their dime? Come on. Yeah, you can't call yourself an independent investigator when you, you know, you go on someone else's dime, a specific involved party's dime, let's say that. Right, and you work for an organization that historically defends controversial religions, aka cults. Yeah. So let's get back to Lu Yingshan and Zhang Fan. When we last left them, in October of 2008, they had connected online over a shared interest in Eastern Lightning texts. I cannot tell from the research I've done whether either of these women officially joined the Church of Almighty God, or if they took spiritual inspiration from its literature and joined a divergent sect that already existed. Zhang Fan traveled to Zhao Yuan alone, where Lu Yingshan lived, and joined her in a home and study group for Almighty God believers. The small assembly was led by a couple named Lu Yu Wang and Fan Bin, who at some point served time in prison but continued preaching after their release. Lu Ying Chun was higher in this miniature cult's hierarchy than Zheng Fan, and thus served as her shepherd in the group. Meanwhile, Zheng Fan worked on converting her family. Soon enough, her mother, Chen Zhuzhan, and father, Zhang Lidong, agreed to move with their other children to Zhao Yuan and become more active members of the sect. From that point onward, the Zhang family largely bankrolled the cult's operations. They rented spaces for the group to meet, and even allowed other members to live with them or in housing they had purchased. They also cooked, drove people around, and organized logistics for the group. Okay, but to be fair, talk about hitting the jackpot for recruitment. Like, you get a family that not only funds your cult operations and rent you space to, like, you know, preach, but also offers you a decent house, a meal, and literally even folds your laundry. Like, this is a dream for any recruitment department at a cult. Also, clearly the Zhang family has money, so that doesn't necessarily mean that they're educated or like have quote-unquote good jobs, but it's likely that they do. But actually, if you look at cults, literally anyone is susceptible to recruiting, like any economic background, any other religious history. Like you think, oh, well, me, I have a master's degree. I'd never fall for that. But like people do all the time. Oh, yeah. There's nothing between education and like being immune to the appeals of the community that are offered by cults. So the Zhangs often gave relief money to other believers with financial struggles. At one point, Zhang Fan even asked her mother for 50,000 yuan, or almost 8,000 US dollars by today's conversion, to help resettle Li Yuang and Fan Bin after their release from prison. But soon, the cult found trouble in paradise. Zheng Fan became increasingly critical of Li Yuang's leadership and suggested that other sect members were evil spirits who should be expelled from the group. Perhaps as part of the family mainly funding the cult, Zheng Fan believed that she deserved a more considerable say in their membership. Regardless, the sect split up as Zheng Fan became even more rigorous in her beliefs. Eventually, the family became completely closed to others, except for Lu Yingshan, who remained with them. Now, Zheng Fan and Lu Yingshan began preaching that they were, in fact, the embodiment of Jesus Christ on earth, and that they shared a soul. I wonder if this is a case of folie à deux combined with a family element or folie en famille. 
Folie à deux, sometimes called shared psychosis, is when two people experience the same delusions or hallucinations. In this case, Yingshan and Fan believe that they shared a soul of Jesus Christ, convincing themselves and even Fan's family that this is true. I'm not a psychologist, but there's undoubtedly some serious mental illness going on here. These people need help. Okay, I know Zhang Fan has convinced herself this is true, but I wonder if Lu Yingchan is just sort of grifting. Because I feel like, I don't know, I feel like Lu Yingchan is exploiting a family's position, like what appears to be a comfortable lifestyle. Maybe. And sort of in my reading of the case, it's definitely Zhang Fan, I'd say, more than anyone else who appears to me to have a serious mental illness. Like she even talks about how she felt depressed and suicidal previously in her life. But she legally, as we'll go on to see, faces a harsher consequence than Lu Yingshen. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, which is why I'm bringing it up. Like if she was the one who faced the most severe legal consequences, which we can get into later then surely she must have been a lot more of a driving force in this cult than even Lu Yingchan, who I I guess might be a bit more self-aware. I think more than anyone else, Zheng Fan is truly deluded and believes the things that she is preaching. I don't think she's making it up like to earn money or exploit people or something. Oh yeah, absolutely. Oh, I agree. Zheng Fan herself sounds like she bought her own mythology wholesale. Mm Mm-hmm. By this point, the family had distanced themselves from Zhao Weishan's Church of Almighty God, or Eastern Lightning. They rejected the central belief that Yang Xingbin was the reincarnation of Jesus Christ, instead insisting that he lived inside Yingshan and Fan. Zheng Fan later told police that after she met Lu Yingshan, her life completely changed. She no longer wanted to work in broadcasting, and instead wanted to devote all her time to Lu. Quote, The church is actually Lu Yingshan alone, end quote, she said. This sounds like an infatuation to me. Something about Lu Yingshan captivated Zheng Fan like nothing else ever had. By the end of 2013, Zheng Fan had told her parents that if they genuinely believed she and Lu Yingshan were Jesus Christ in the flesh, they would transfer all their property and other assets into the women's names. The parents agreed. Damn, girl, that is some serious finessing. Convincing your parents that you are literally Jesus and they have to give you all their money. Obviously, this family has some heavy issues, but as the high-achieving daughter in my house, that is so beyond the scope of anything I could ever imagine doing. Like, what the hell? Yeah, but your parents don't believe your the resurrected soul of Jesus <laughs> Christ himself. <laughs> and I so. don't think I would ever be able to convince them. This also makes me wonder if Zhang Fan and Lu Yingshan were more than just friends. The whole sharing a soul thing sounds a lot like soulmates to me, and Fan asked her parents to give their assets to both of them. Maybe I'm just reading too much into these clues, but it's definitely not like any friendship I've ever had. Oh, there's definitely more than just a friendship there, or at least even if it's just one-sided, even if Zhang Fan has a sort of one-sided unilateral infatuation with Lu, Mm -hmm. I think it's a lot more than just a normal friendship. But also, I could say that I hate cults as much as the next Marxist, but I have to respect a well-executed hustle when I see one, and that's just massive respect to that. I mean, going on to what you said before, I wonder if Lu Yingshan is fully aware that Zhang Fan is obsessed with her and is willing to exploit that and say, like, give me all your parents' money. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you can do it, why not? Go ahead. Then, things began falling apart even within the Zhang family. Fan's younger siblings, Sister Hang, and the brother who has not been named because he was a minor, consistently found themselves in trouble at school. They changed school several times, but after a number of suspensions, dropped out entirely. This, of course, isolated them even further. According to Zheng Fan, she tried to educate her siblings with a religious upbringing. But unlike the other family members, they weren't so interested in the second coming. According to the Beijing News, the younger siblings spent their time playing video games and watching movies online. Zheng Hong is also a die-hard Korean fan, which I think means she was into K-pop. Okay, yes, but we can't assume anything. I mean, there could also be a real possibility that Zheng Hong could have been very interested in the political minute of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. I mean, she might have just had very strong opinions on whether Kim Jong-un should be succeeded by his sister, Kim Yo-jong, or his uncle, Kim Pyong-il. You don't think she just really liked BTS? 
No, I, I I fully believe that she has strong opinions on who should be the mayor of Pyongyang and, you know, the annual city budget of, of Pyongyang. By May of 2014, Zheng Fan and Liu Yingchun were becoming even more unhinged. For reasons I cannot find, the two women turned on Chen Zhuzhan, Fan's mother, and encouraged the others in the group to, quote, recognize Chen Zhuzhan's evil face, end quote. It's never explicitly stated in the article, but it sounds like they expelled Chen Zhuzhan from the sect. According to Zhang Fan's confession to the police, her younger siblings were initially upset at their mother being labeled a demon and forced to leave, as anyone would be. But they eventually woke up to her evil nature. Fan told her siblings that she had recovered memories of her mother torturing and killing animals in front of them. After the abuse, Chen would hypnotize them and modify their memories. The Beijing News reports, quote, In order to awaken the memory of her younger brother and sister, Zheng Fan posted papers with the words, killing, torturing, killing animals, and beating dogs on the wall, end quote. So Zheng Fan and Liu Yingchun clearly run this house, and I'd say out of the two, Fan is the most dangerous to her own family. Okay, first of all, I just want to say that the accusations that Chen was beating dogs is very ironic because we're going to come to this in a bit. But also this whole like, you know, seeding false memories into the kids. It kind of reminds me of, you know, when there was this whole like satanic panic in the 90s. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, with like kids being made to testify that they were like taken into tunnels and abused by teachers and whatnot. And I, it turned out to be just an extension of the sort of gay panic, like against gay people and against minorities and so on. I feel like this is very similar. It's very insidious. Yeah, it's really fucked up to put that into a child's head. Yeah. Now you're probably wondering, why would Zheng Lidong, the father, allow his daughter to cast out his wife and brainwash his other children? Well, perhaps this can be explained by the fact that after Chen left, Lidong called up Zhang Kelan a young woman who they knew from Wuji, who was also devoted in some way to the Almighty God ideologies, and asked her to come to Zhao Yuan to be his partner. At this point, Li Dong was 55 years old and Kiao Lian was 24. I have no idea how these two met or what kind of relationship they had before May of 2014, but it sounds to me like Li Dong had taken a mistress in Kiao Lian. And once his wife was out of the picture, it was time to move her in. The day before the murder, Liu Yingchun told Li Dong and Kiao Lan that they were the earthly embodiments of Adam and Eve, and this affirmation apparently made Li Dong very happy. So Li Dong and Kiao Lan are now wholly wrapped up in this shared delusion of being the reincarnation of biblical figures. Also, middle-aged Li Dong is probably boinking a 24-year-old, so he's not going to complain. I mean, Adam and Eve did have sex to bring about the human race, so him boinking his mistress is biblically ordained. Right, it's all in the Bible. It's all right there. Yeah. Now, we have to talk about Lewis. Major content warning here for animal abuse. Lewis was the family's pet Bichon Frise, a small white dog typically weighing between 3 and 5 kilograms, or 6.5 to 11 pounds. They're pretty cute, in my opinion. I have no idea whether the family actually called him Lewis, or if the translator just translates his name that way. We're going to call him Lewis because that's what it says. The idea of a Chinese cult family naming their dog Lewis is just absolutely hilarious to me, and I'm so sorry because what happens to Lewis is terrible. On May 26th, 2014, two days before they killed Wu Shuyan, the Zhang family, along with Lu Yingshan and Zhang Kelan, are hanging out in the living room talking shit about Shen Zhuzhan. Lu Yingchun reiterates that she was evil, and she's glad the mother is out of the picture. Then, Lou notices Louis baring his teeth, as if he's angry at the group. She says that she recognizes Shen Zhuzhan's face in the dog's eyes. Lou believes that Louis, having been raised by Shen Zhuzhan, may have become an incarnation of her, a relic of the devil still in their house. Okay, but these people are very obsessed with reincarnations, you know, like... Everyone is just either a recreation of some biblical figure or just like local people they know. And it's really quite annoying and cliche. Like, if you're going to go all out on making a cult, make up some new characters. Make up some like, invent some entire new mythology. Fucking hell, you run this cult. Go. Lots of cults do it though. And I think it's a form of manipulation. Because when a cult leader starts to lose a grip on people, he or she will suddenly be like, you're the angel Gabriel. And they're like, oh. 
great, fuck, well, I'll stay then. But, like, I guess that only works if you're like, okay, you're the inner reincarnation of Gabriel. Here are the perks. Like, you get to have, like, eight mistresses or whatever. I think it's so interesting when people say they must have drowned in a past life because they're afraid of water or something like that. Like, I've never felt anything like that in my whole life. Yeah. Oh, same here. Yeah. Can't relate. God has never talked to me. That's never happened to me. So at this point, Lu pointed at Louis and yelled, Chen Zhuzhan, I recognize you. And Louis appeared to calm down. The Beijing News writes that he was, quote, acting like a baby, end quote. So Lu initially thought the problem had been solved. Man, this remake of The Exorcist has really gone <laughs> down budget. Soon after, however, Lu felt a numbness in her legs and a pain in her chest. She told Zhang Fan that Louis was supernaturally attacking her. Zhang Fan sprung into action. She later told the police, quote, Louis dared to hurt my favorite person and the kindest god, end quote. Zhang Fan found Louis hiding underneath the coffee table, picked him up by his tail, and threw him into the hallway, and hit him with a mop until he was dead, just as the group would do to Wu Shuiyan two days later. Jesus Christ. Evidently, the family cult had become increasingly disturbed, escalating to violence against an animal, which is often a precursor to violence against other people. They later confessed that Zhang Fan had stated her intention to find and murder her own mother as a way to defeat the person she saw as the king of evil spirits. Years of descent into the madness of this religious cult eventually culminated in the murder of Wu Shuiyan. Shuiyan was simply minding her own business and had the misfortune of coming across this sect at the peak of its collective delusions. I can't put into words how sorry I feel for her and her family. In their police interviews and at their trial, Lu Yingshan, Zhang Fan, and Zhang Lidan reiterated that Wu Shuiyan was, quote, an evil spirit, end quote, who must die before she could devour everybody. You can watch footage of the trial online, and even if, like me, you don't understand Chinese, it's really spooky how calmly they describe Shuiyan as a demon as though they're still thoroughly embedded in the delusion and expect the court to agree with them. I mean, they could have hired the O.J. Simpson lawyers. I mean, Robert Kardashian would have definitely gotten them off and definitely discouraged them from using the she was a demon defense. Of course, this defense didn't work, and Zhang Fan and her father Zhang Lidong were sentenced to death for their part in the murder and executed on February 2nd, 2015. Liu Ying Chun was sentenced to life in prison. According to Chinese media, she has since reformed her beliefs, becoming a voice in the anti-cult movement and writing about how the experience with the Almighty God teachings led her down a path of destruction. Now, like we said before, I think Zhang Fan 100% had a mental illness, not that it excuses violence or anything like that. And like you said, Liu Yingshun seems like more of a grifter. And I think it's interesting that she got life, whereas Zhang Fan got the death penalty. But maybe they saw her as being a legitimate target for reform? Yeah, I guess if Lu Yang Chun was really a grifter, it would have made more sense to like use her as a sort of vehicle for reform. Because if she was a grifter, then she could see the opportunity in becoming that sort right. of person who's like, I used to be a cultist, but now I'm anti-cult. Whereas Zhang Fan seems like a true believer. Those people are beyond reason and negotiation. Right. So I actually wonder here if capital punishment was more because they didn't see Zhang Fan and Zhang Lidong as targets for re-education, whereas they thought that Lu Yingshan could legitimately be rehabilitated to some degree. Oh, yeah, I think so as well. Yeah. Zhang Hang, the younger sister, was sentenced to 10 years in prison, and she and her younger brother have also left the cult and seek to reintegrate into society. Zhang Qiaolian was given a seven-year sentence, and I can't find information on what she has been up to since although she should be getting out of prison any time now if she hasn't already. All of this brings us back to the question of whether Wu Shuiyan's murderers followed the banned Eastern Lightning sect. If her attackers were, as some media reports, members of Eastern Lightning, this bolsters the government's case that Eastern Lightning is a dangerous religious cult that has inflicted violence upon innocent people as part of its recruiting fervor. On the other hand, if the assailants were not members of Eastern Lightning, it forwards the group's narrative that the authorities have unfairly maligned them. So let's look at the evidence we have. The people who murdered Wu Shuiyan claimed to worship some sort of Almighty God, but admitted themselves that their God was a different one from the Almighty God of Eastern Lightning. 
Emily Dunn writes, quote, International media outlets repeated the Chinese assessment of the Church of Almighty God as bizarre and violent. What they overlooked were Liu Yingshan and Zheng Fan's statements to the courts that although they had started out as members of Eastern Lightning in 1998 and 2007 respectively, they had outgrown it. In Liu's words, Zheng Fan and I are the only spokespeople for the true Almighty God. The one that the state is cracking down on is Zhao Weishan's Almighty God, not our Almighty God. They are the fake Almighty God. Only we are the true Almighty God. Eastern Lightning's blog wasted no time in pointing out this divergence and distancing itself from the psychopaths. End quote. Okay, but this is the same as like ISIS branching off from like Al Qaeda and Syria, and then, you know, each faction pointing at the other and being like, look at how brutal and bad they are. We're the correct and only representatives of true Islam in the region. And, you know, just because you're not them, it doesn't mean you're good objectively. Right. I think this is probably the most accurate assessment of the attacker's membership in Eastern Lightning. They once had an interest in the group, but branched off to start their own cult. They borrowed ideas like Jesus Christ reappearing in the body of a woman or women and the language of Almighty God, but they weren't official members of Eastern Lightning at the time of the murder. Does that mean that Eastern Lightning is innocent? Of this specific crime, probably. But that doesn't mean they're harmless. Just as people in the United States report losing family members to cults like the Church of Scientology and even QAnon, people in China have seen their loved ones drawn into and exploited by Eastern Lightning. Is criminalizing Eastern Lightning the answer? I personally have no time for organized religion and I often find it repressive, but I don't think it should be illegal, and neither did Mao according to his essays. I believe states should be secular, but I'm stuck on the degree to which they should be able to regulate religious expression be that state China or France. And I do fear that when the line between an ethnic group and religious sect is blurred, state interference can quickly become oppression. Eastern Lightning sounds weird and creepy and probably uses its members for money, but people shouldn't be punished by the state for being duped or used. To stop people from joining cults, we have to address root problems like alienation. If people are drawn to the soul of soulless conditions, as Marx wrote, we must change those conditions. That's well said, and I completely agree. I do think that, like I mentioned earlier, there is a big difference between criminalizing people for their beliefs as individuals and religious parties or organizations as political entities. I mean, I don't think that state should target people for their individual spirituality, whatever that may be, though I I might have personal disdain for some aspects of that. But I also think that it is reasonable to enshrine secularism as a non-negotiable aspect of a state and to enforce that secularism through banning political parties that don't accept that secularism, so to speak. You know, like I think France gets a lot of criticism for a lot of its behavior and some of it's warranted, but I do heavily sympathize with the French approaches, sort of militant secularism, if you will. Well, I think as well, there's a huge difference between discriminating against all members of a certain religion, and then discriminating against extremists of any religion. I don't think religion should be off limits to criticism. It's a huge, huge part of people's lives. It's a huge part of the world. And it also does lead to the oppression of a lot of people in some cases. You can't just say, oh, this is, you can't critique that because it's religion. Like, that's... Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I agree. Yeah. So... Speaking of cults, we have our own at www.patreon.com slash dascriminal. And if you join at some time this week, you should get a mini episode and a full-length bonus episode. Oh, and you get access to all the library of the back library of previous bonus episodes. So you get to dig in, you know? Yeah, definitely a good way to spend your time if you have finished the Bible and you're looking for your next piece of literature. Yeah. You can find us on Instagram at Das Criminal Pod, And please, please, guys, rate and review us on your favorite podcast app and tell your friends. Post about us. Yeah, or better yet, maybe you and your friends can go into your local McDonald's, okay, and tell everyone in that McDonald's about this podcast and try and convince them to listen to this podcast. Little Sheep 1, Little Sheep 2. Et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So thank you guys for listening. We appreciate it so very much. We love you dearly. 
yeah until next time everyone bye, bye.